Hi again, it's Jason from Fraser Valley Rose Farm and today I want to jump right into these recommendations of roses that you could use in containers or pots around your yard or on your deck. Now a couple of notes real quick before I get going right into the recommendations is number one, these are only 20 picks and of course I'll have to move them through quite quickly because there are 20 of them. I'll try to put up on the screen uh, information such as their size, ultimate size, their zone hardiness, their scent or fragrance. And uh, because there again are only 20 of them, they may not be the same as your picks. And for those who, who are experienced at growing roses in containers, I would really appreciate it. If you have ones that you really love in containers, drop those into the comments below the video and we can all share our expertise together. Uh, finally, I do have some tips for growing roses in containers that I'll put up at this timestamp here. So you can either wait until that point or or skip through to that point for my recommendations on how to grow in containers. The very first rose on my list here, and this is not presented in any order, but this one typifies what I would recommend for roses in containers is Cream Veranda. Now the Veranda series of roses was actually bred exactly for this purpose, for small roses that fit well into this type of size of container that I think is practical for most gardeners in that range of 20 to 24 inches across. So Cream Veranda has a great color, a decent scent, and uh, is just built for this purpose. Along those same lines, let's jump right into a couple of recommendations for miniature roses because miniature roses again just owing to their size are really appropriate for that small pot size. One that I featured last year on this channel was called Crackling Fire. Fantastic rose with a great color. It's proving to be a really good grower in my garden and something novel or interesting and I'm picking a lot of these just to show you the range of things that could be grown in containers is called Scarlet Moss and moss roses are uh, sort of typically very very large roses but this one was bred by the late Ralph Moore and it has that wonderful mossy uh, covering on the epidermis of the rose but also uh, beautiful red flowers. It's a rebloomer and fairly compact. Next one up on my list is a rose called Bolero and I've picked it this high on the list just to show you that you can have your cake and eat it too in terms of fragrance. This one is a strongly fragrant rose, white flowers with either a cream or pink undertone depending on how you catch it. Next one on the list again to show you the range is Marisa Trillo. This one is just a killer color. Look at just flashy lots of splashes of color in this one. So fantastic rose and again in a moderate size range and uh, also, oh so easy paprika. Now I showed you this one when I did a tour of the Summerland Gardens last year and uh, they were using it very effectively as a landscape rose, uh, but it is of a size that it can be used for a container as well. Hey, try out this color combination. Life of the Party has these pastel candy colored pink, yellow, and white all in the same bloom. So this is just a gorgeous color combination. Next up, I wanted to talk about Little White Pet, which also has pink buds, but purest white flowers, and is just a really outstanding performer, always in bloom. And I wanna throw at you, one of my personal favorites is Arthur Bell. Arthur Bell is a yellow floribunda. Uh, I always recommend Julia Child, but Arthur Bell is almost, it's like on the same level here because of it has a stronger fragrance. It, it doesn't last quite as long in color, so it fades a little bit faster, but Arthur Bell is a great pick for containers. I would love to recommend for you Beverly. Beverly is a pink blend rose, lighter in the center and darker on the outside, but it was also really well known for is being recommended by different rose societies as a tough adaptable rose, especially in warmer or humid climates. I also want to recommend uh, Glad Tidings. Glad Tidings, to my mind, is the perfect small red floribunda, with the exception of the fact that it doesn't have a strong fragrance. But other than that, it is repeat blooming, great form, fantastic rose. Now let me just quickly throw in Cinco de Mayo at this point, which is not everybody's cup of tea because it's a very distinct looking rose, but it does have those ruffled edges and a color somewhere between orange and russet, just gorgeous and striking and perfect for containers. I've shown you Playboy on my channel before. This is the classic Floribunda with fairly open blooms and a bright blend of pinks and oranges and reds. Just a fantastic show of color in the garden. And speaking of great color, I wanna show you another pick is L. And L is a wonderful blend of pink and orange and orange pink and all of those great colors makes this a real display of color as well. 
I'm sure some people are asking whether David Austin roses should be used in containers. Now, I will say that in general, David Austin roses are, are built to be, bred to be, large, impressive shrubs in the garden, so they're better off in the ground. However, they have bred a few that are more compact in size, can be maintained in that three to four foot range that would make them make sense in containers or a large container anyway. First one I want to show you is Grace in Apricot, and I think this is one of their newer selections, uh, but great color on that one. But also, I love Jubilee Celebration. I am a huge fan of that sort of salmon pink color, which uh, it shows, and it's a, it's a gorgeous one. And of course, I can't leave off Lady Emma Hamilton, which is coppery orange, and I just love that color. I have another one named Pat Austin, which I also love in the same color, but uh, Lady Emma is fantastic. If you're counting along at home, we're down to our final three, so I shouldn't go any further without including a classic choice for containers. This is the Fairy, a polyantha rose that is well known for always being in bloom, lots of little pink flowers and basically indestructible great plant. I also want to include the next one called Pillow Fight. Pillow Fight I believe is a seedling of gourmet popcorn which is a mini that I love. This one's a little bit larger, a little more vigorous and always in bloom. Beautiful pure white flowers so Pillow Fight earns its place in the garden. And just to round out all the color selections that I've given you which there are plenty, I want to give you Twilight Zone as my final choice here which is uh, again relatively compact but has that deep purple color and a strong citrus spice fragrance that you'll enjoy in the garden. Colors can vary a little bit depending on weather, but it is a great pick. Well, now's the time in the video, and I told you that I would remind you of some of my recommendations for growing roses in containers, and try to remember that the basic thing is you're trying to balance something that in nature is already balanced, that is, the roots to the top growth of the plant. In uh, the garden, of course, it basically has an unlimited space to put its roots, so it can draw moisture and fertilizer or nutrients up from the soil in an unlimited kind of a way, and the soil is very uh, stable in terms of its temperature and moisture content, or at least compared to a container. That's that's why you should choose the largest pot size that you can manage uh, for those roses that are in the range of three feet tall or four feet tall. That's about the maximum I'd recommend for a container that's about 20 to 24 inches across, or that's about 50 to 60 centimeters, which is a fairly large pot size. Now, of course, you can go to a larger rows, but then you should proportionately increase the size of that container. Now, what do you fill it with? I usually like to say that uh, Natural soil is good for in the ground and potting soil is the best for a pot because it's really engineered for impeccable drainage and it's also engineered to be light so that you can move that container around. It doesn't hold a whole ton of nutrients. You have to supply that yourself. So you should plan on watering this if you've got the appropriate size of top growth to root growth uh, two to three times a week in regular weather, maybe a little bit more during hotter weather. And you should be planning on fertilizing ongoing. I, in this case, I do like to recommend a controlled release fertilizer, something like Osmocote or Nutricote, to give you a base level of nutrient release over a long length of time. And then you can top it up with a liquid feed of your choice, either organic or not. Now, in terms of how you fill that container, uh, some people recommend a layer on the bottom, a drainage layer, like broken pots or styrofoam chips or that kind of thing. Forgo that if you can. It really does uh, negatively impact both the soil volume in the container because you want as much soil volume as you can there for the roots to reach uh, moisture and nutrients uh, but also it negatively impacts the drainage within that pot so don't do that and if you can and this isn't the case if you're on a deck or a patio but if you're out in the garden if you can have a bottomless container that's even better because then the roots will go through the bottom and reach the garden soil and have that sort of unlimited reservoir of moisture and nutrients. In terms of ongoing care pruning of course is an important thing to try to keep them in shape and condition and I usually recommend this at the same time as I do it for my outdoor plants in that late winter early spring stretch where I can see the damage the winter has caused I can cut out that dead damaged diseased crossing branches from the center to improve air circulation and then just prune it down for shape and size for the season uh, in terms of repotting yeah every two to three years you should consider it it really should be guided by how much of trouble you're having keeping that rose watered and fertilized and if you 
find that you're having to water it every day or it's just having trouble keeping itself uh, in good condition, then it's time to consider repotting either into a larger pot, preferably, or you can put it out in the garden and get a smaller plant to go in there. Uh, or you can just take it out of the pot, uh, loosen up some of that old soil, get rid of some of the congested roots across the bottom and then give it a fresh potting soil as you put it back in and just watch your pruning from there onward. Overwintering may take a little special consideration for roses in containers because they're more vulnerable than the ones that are in the ground. They just don't have that stable temperature like the ones in the ground. So what I do in this climate here is that I look for the forecast and anytime I have a cold snap that's worse than general for my climate, I'll take all those container roses and I'll stick them into my garage where it's a little more moderated. And then I take them out afterwards. They really are better off with the outdoor air circulation unless you have really, really deep cold. So that's what I do here if that's not an option for you. You consider uh, outbuildings or sheds or uh, up against the side of the house or against a, a fence. Wherever it is sheltered from that cutting wind uh, is a good way to go. You could certainly consider wrapping it in burlap or some way that doesn't trap a whole bunch of moisture against the canes or against the crown as well. All right, that's the tips I had for you. Those are my choices for container roses. If you have any questions or suggestions of your own, please drop those down in the comments below the video. I'll see what I can do to help.